Welcome back to Backyard Ballistics. Today I've got a one-of-a-kind video for you, composed by two parts, both uploaded at the same time, and one extra part reserved for my patrons. That's why it took so long to make, from next video I'll be back with a normal upload schedule. Anyway, I'm telling you a true story, and I think this is the first time it is told on YouTube. It's the story of a very weird ammunition concept and how it was invented. It all started one day when a young gunsmith was asked by an older colleague which was the simplest to make practical firearm. He was probably trying to test the knowledge of the youngster, but the reply of the latter came totally unexpected. He said that he could build a reasonably practical gun with only a barrel and a hammer, but only if he was allowed to fire two projectiles at once. The older gunsmith was quite skeptical, thinking that what the youngster had in mind was one of those dodgy slam fire designs, but he was also intrigued by the double bullet thing, so he decided to wait and see what the other had in mind. Now, instead of going ahead with the story, let's first try to solve the riddle on our own and see if the youngster really stood a chance. The fact he asked for two bullets either meant he had something up his sleeve or that he hadn't got a clue what he was doing, in which case I wouldn't be telling you the story in the first place. So with only a barrel at his disposal and no bolt, he could have only made a muzzle loader, no surprise there. The only way of loading it had to be from the muzzle, but something more elegant than sticking a ramrod down the barrel was required for the design to be considered practical. A radically different way, and maybe that's why two bullets instead of one were required. Let me illustrate what we have. Here are two bullets and some powder. The reason the bullets look a bit weird is because they are shotgun slugs. Differently from regular bullets, which are fired in rifled barrels, these are designed to be aerodynamically stable and can therefore be fired from smooth bores. Since we're trying to solve a very challenging problem, getting rid of the additional complication of a rifling seemed logic. But why two of them? Stacking them directly on top of each other would really make no sense, so the only other thing we could think of is to put an additional charge of powder between them. Now, this kind of makes sense. You see, what the powder does is burn and create high pressure gas. That pressure acts the same on every surface it is in contact with, so both on the top and on the bottom bullet. The difference, of course, is in the direction of motion. While the top bullet is pushed out of the barrel, the bottom one is thrown towards the bridge, pushing the main charge with it. After all, who said that the barrel can only be traversed one way? With this configuration, it is used both to load and to fire the bullet. I know that it looks crazy, but this is what our gunsmith probably had in mind. The recoil from the firing of the first charge is used to fully load the second one, so that it can be fired using all of the barrel's length. In fact, the first bullet is of no ballistic interest and is only used as a ballast to compensate for the momentum given to the main charge. This layout seems quite reasonable, but the list of problems our gunsmith had to face was still long. Let's explore them one by one. Let's start with an easy to fix one, how to ignite the powder charge once it reaches the bridge. Well, considering that at that point the bullet is still moving backwards at a considerable velocity, the impact with the closed bridge is more than enough to set off any sort of percussion cap, maybe with the help of some sort of disposable firing pin placed between the cap and the bullet. Nothing is truly empty, not completely, and a barrel is certainly far from that. It's full of air at atmospheric pressure, and throwing the bullet down the barrel at great speed will cause it to compress, resisting movement. Think of a syringe with the nozzle plugged. There is no easy way of getting rid of that air. The space between the bridge plug and the bullet has to be airtight for firing, just like in the syringe. Having some compressed air mixed with the powder charge, however, is not that bad in principle. Not only that air will re-expand during the forward travel of the bullet, but its oxygen content can allow the combustion of leftover fuel, increasing the energy output of the propelling charge. This means, however, that the precursor charge didn't simply have to move the main bullet and charge to the bottom of the barrel, but also to provide the energy needed to compress the air. So what he could have done was increasing the impulse of the precursor charge so that the main cartridge was thrown fast enough to compress the air down to an acceptably small volume. Considering that some free space is naturally present between the grains of powder, if enough push is available, the ammo could still work. Since a substantial amount of impulse needs to be extracted from the precursor charge, we need to do some tuning. Until now, I randomly placed the stacked bullets in the upper portion of the barrel, however, this won't be the case in practical use. Since we don't want to use any ramrod, after loading the ammo, the ballast would rest very close to the muzzle, like you see in the model now. 
If the precursor charge was to fire now, the barrel time of the ballast would be very small. So small, actually, that not all of the powder would have time to ignite, let alone burn. It is fundamental to push everything back at least one inch. One could use a spacer for demonstration I'm using a plastic wood, but this would make the cartridge long and cumbersome. What I think the gunsmith had in mind was to use a hollow ballast instead of a simple bullet, and I'm pretty confident that he was thinking of something like this. A hollow body can allow room for the powder and keep the barrel sealed for a distance equal to its length. In a way, we could call it a telescopic design. This keeps the overall length short and also allows easy ignition of the precursor charge simply by heating the primer of the case. Good, so how do we keep everything together? The best way would have been that of using a long, straight walled case which could act both as the ballast and as the holder for the various parts. Here you can have a look at my take at it where I used a 410 shell to make a realistic model. This design would however require the barrel to have a chamber rimmed out from the muzzle so that the extra thickness of the casing could be accommodated. You see, if the bore was uniform without a chamber, for the bullet to fit inside the case and the case inside the barrel, the bullet would need to be undersized by two times the thickness of the casing, which is only acceptable if the case walls are very thin. The last challenge for the gunsmith was avoiding premature ignition of the main charge. Once the precursor charge is ignited, hot gases must not overtake the bullet or they could prematurely ignite the main charge, rendering the whole contraption useless. Now, normally bullets and bores have a tight fit and not enough gas for a flamethrower is passed. However, our gunsmith couldn't count on that. In order to avoid interfering with the loading stroke, a slightly undersized bullet was still required. Solving this wasn't probably too hard though, powdered wadding can be used to adapt to the bore diameter, making a good seal. Sealing the gases behind the slug, on the other hand, is accomplished by the expansion of the hollow base of the projectile, caused by the rapid increase in pressure after the main charge is ignited. A similar design was historically first used in the Minier Bowl, which allowed ease of loading in rifled muskets, with the base of the bullet expanding and engaging rifling upon firing. Anyway, once out of the barrel, the powder wadding crumbles and the slug is free on its path. Or is it? Both strokes took overall less than 10 milliseconds, meaning that the ballast hasn't had time to get too far. The distance travelled by it when the bullet comes out of the barrel depends on many factors, but it can be roughly estimated to be similar to the barrel length. Now, the bullet moves at least three times as fast as the ballast, meaning that there is a very high chance of them colliding, and this can happen. Now, this problem is not really that hard to solve, since the ballast casing could be easily deflected by using a slightly longer and heavier hammer, which, after striking the primer, would bend the trajectory of the case by a few degrees, freeing up the path for the main bullet. So in conclusion, I would say that the young gunsmith really stood a chance of winning his bet. If you want to know for sure, you can see my model work in practice now by clicking this link. It's the video of the test fire. I had to split these into pieces, but they were uploaded together, so you can watch it now. I hope you'll understand. See you very soon. Bye.